Hello, in today's podcast we have the honor with... Louise. Hi, I'm Luke. And I'm Tone, and we're going to talk about uh, Louise's most recent paper. It's about a barber shop somewhere in Germany. Louise, can you tell us more about it? Yeah, of course. So my recent paper was about language, um, space and activity in a multi-ethnic barber shop in Frankfurt in Germany. And so this context was interesting to me because it's a space in which people from all different backgrounds, countries of origin, uh, with different language repertoires come together um, and perform different activities together. And I was interested in how they manage this linguistic diversity, what kind of patterns and strategies emerge from their, from their everyday engagements. And how did you come up with the specific idea of a barbershop? It was um, a, a nice little accident, actually. I, was, um, I spent time in Frankfurt doing an internship and came across this neighbourhood. Um, and I was actually originally interested in the public signage, um, which is uh, in a diverse range of languages. And I was taking photographs of some posters and just stumbled into this barbershop, um, spent some time there and saw that some really interesting things were going on in terms of language in this space. Um, and I found not only the, the kind of mix of people coming together there interesting, but also because it's a barbershop, um, you expect to, in terms of the, the professional identities of barbers or hairdressers, they, they like to talk to their customers. And so from the perspective of language, it was interesting because I've got this mix of people from all different backgrounds and they're talking to each other. So it gave me a nice, a nice way in for investigating linguistic diversity. So how did you go about it? You went in there, you went to observe, or how did you do it? Yep, I just went in. Um, I spent four weeks there on two separate occasions. Firstly, I just got to know uh, the people there for a week or so without doing any kind of recording or interviewing or anything like that. Um, so that they would kind of begin to trust me. And... Then I um, started recording some interactions between barbers and clients um, and also in the separate kind of cafe area which is attached to the barbershop um, and just observing their activities, uh, writing down notes and um, writing down tables of where people are from and their repertoires and so on. So what were the profile of the people actually in the barbershop? What nationality were they in? So... In the four weeks that I was there, um, I counted people from 27 different um, countries of origin, um, and that's all across Asia, Europe, uh, Central and Northern Africa, and they've lived in Germany for different periods of time. Some were born there, some um, came when, when they were adolescents, and some later on in life, and they, have, as it, they may have settled in different countries as well, so they didn't go directly to Germany, but settled in other countries and so picked up bits of language there and um, all different jobs, different religions um, and so a very diverse group of people. Were there already particular details that uh, struck you while observing? Well what struck me most was that linguistic diversity for these people is just a mundane part of everyday life. It's not seen as a problem when I was doing my interviews. I think I started off um, you know, as you do with this kind of dominant idea of bounded languages and you think, oh, this, they must, you know, have a lot of misunderstandings and it must be quite un unstable um, and unpredictable, but it really wasn't. Um, and when I was interviewing people, they kind of just started brushing off my questions to begin with because they thought, this isn't relevant. So what were your questions? <laughs> I started, I asked things like, um, okay, so say you have a customer who comes in who... The, the and you would address them in German? Yeah, yeah. So I would speak in German usually, or English some, with some people. Um, and so the manager was originally from Turkey, but has been in Germany since he was one year old. So I sort of asked, okay, so if there's someone that comes in who can't speak Turkish, can't speak German, can't speak English, what do you do? Um, and the manager would say, well, I would I'd talk to them and tell them what we do here, or something so simple like that so they didn't see it from the perspective of okay he doesn't speak the same language as me they sp they see it in terms of okay i need to get across this message to this person how things work here and there was also in terms of the activities that they that they perform in this barbershop they're quite structured and they have particular 
um, patterns which are quite predictable in terms of what the customer might need. And so this is also a way in which the communication is organised, not just in terms of language, but the actual activity that they're performing. Right, so what were some of the key findings that you uncovered? So I was interested in the way in which people manage this linguistic diversity and can communicate with each other, even though they have very different language backgrounds. And what I was finding was that in the patterns of of language in this setting, there are what I call interactional sensitivities, whereby in order to encourage comprehension, people might simplify their speech or emphasise particular parts of a sentence or break things down into smaller chunks. You have the transcripts in your paper. Yes, there are lots of transcripts in the paper, so people can refer back to those and and see exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, Another thing was that people don't just accommodate to German, they also share bits of their heritage um, language resources as well. And so you find people, for example, from Singapore, learning Turkish, um, and actually to the point where they're able to participate in in conversations in Turkish. Um, And things like terms of address or hellos and goodbyes or religious phrases, things like this. And they have um, what I call a license to use these bits of of heritage languages with each other. Um, And it can be used to kind of open up a domain of play within their speech uh, and their their spoken activity. And then the third the third thing was translation and interpreting as well. So I didn't want to produce a kind of romantic account of this barbershop where everybody gets along and talking is fine, everybody manages. There are occasions where this kind of ecumenical German or community German isn't sufficient. And so people might come along with a family member or a friend who interprets for them, or even people like the manager of the barbershop performs this role as well because of his his diverse language proficiencies. He'll kind of monitor the activity and the, the, the spoken activity that's going on. And if he sees any incomprehension arising, then he'll he'll jump in and and give a translation. Um, And the people working there would also help with communicative tasks as well. If people came in with um, forms that they needed help filling in or they wanted uh, information off the internet or something like that, then these people would help them with those kind of tasks as well. What did you like uh, most about your study? What I liked most, um, I guess, was that it, opened up a different perspective, a different way of seeing these kinds of neighbourhoods. Um, I mean, this kind of topic, migration, is, is a big social issue, especially at the moment. And um, I think that by spending time with these people in their everyday lives, you actually um, get to see that they are extremely linguistically flexible and quite adept really at at navigating their neighbourhood and learning to live with differences um, and actually making the most out of them using diversity as a resource and um, having these different ways of connecting and participating with one another. So what's the next stage in your your research? So I'm currently um, doing my PhD which is based in the same neighbourhood in Frankfurt and I look at public signage now, so not spoken communication, but public signage and public conduct in this neighbourhood, uh, which I also see as a form of communication, also with the potential to bring individuals and groups together or also perhaps to separate them by demarcating space.